his own hands in the title chase, Garvey gets back in the win column in late model. It's just a number to Kinzer, but it's number 400 for everyone else. Ernie Irvin talks about his return to the cockpit, and we'll have a look at how Jeff Gordon has changed as a driver and a person. And hi everybody, I'm Pat Patterson, and who says that racing is winding down? We'll be running with the pedal to the metal for the next 60 minutes. First off, let's check in on the next to the last short track race on the schedule, and for a change, Jeff Gordon was not going to be the favorite going into Martinsville. Here's the J-Man with the story. Because of rain, qualifying didn't happen, leaving the field lined up based on points. Jeff Gordon has the pole. Second place points man Dale Earnhardt starts on the outside. And on lap one, it's the Goodwrench car taking the top spot. But just when you think it's safe to put away the poncho, the first caution waves because of a passing rain shower. Back to green, nearing lap 60, and Rusty Wallace is giving Earnhardt all he can handle and then some as he takes the lead. Wallace has won three in a row at Martinsville. Ward Burton's in trouble when he gives the leader a shove. Wallace has to make multiple pit stops to get back in it. Burton is also able to continue. On the restart, Steve Grissom has the lead, but Earnhardt wants it and he takes it with around 100 circuits complete. Then Grissom is the reason for the third caution when he smokes a break in turn one. Trying to leave pit road can be hazardous, but no harm and no one gets any damage. From Morgan Shepard's roof cam, we get a great look at why the fourth yellow flies when Elton Sawyer and Robert Presley spin in turn three. Then Presley gets together with Ted Musgrave, and Musgrave rides the backstretch wall in the family channel number 16. From Musgrave's bumper cam, the world gets sideways in a hurry. Musgrave is okay, but he is done for the afternoon. It takes Wallace a lot of laps to do it, but with a slip by leader Terry Labonte, the Miller car is back on the point. But then on fresher tires, Earnhardt goes by Wallace for the final lead change of the day. So in the closing laps, Labonte is battling Wallace for second as Dell Earnhardt pulls away for his 67th career win. Labonte edges Wallace for runner-up with Bobby Hamilton and Jeff Bodine rounding out the top five. For On Pit Road Final Edition, I'm Jason Young reporting. Unhappy family there. Now, Earnhardt made up a 34 points uh, today with that win. He's still 275 down, but he just won't go away. That's why he's a seven-time champion. Marlon, Martin, and Musgrave are reasonably safe in their positions. In the news, the news, the news, Barry Dodson has left the Sabco Racing Team and driver Kyle Petty, the 1989 Winston Cup Championship crew chief, changed his departure from season's end to this past week, and two crewmen joined him. The uh, team has a win at Dover this year, but otherwise, you can forget about it. Uh, Michael Waltrip uh, has not had a great year either. He's still winless and out of the Bahari ride at season's end. We're hearing that the Wood Brothers have him on their list of possible replacements for their departing Morgan Shepard. Somehow, when you mention Jeff Gordon and the Hendrick Motorsports team, the word rotten just doesn't fit anywhere ever since July. That team has paced the points, and as Mark Allen reports, it seems they're holding up just fine under the pressure of their first title chase. Believe it or not, this team has had to make some adjustments since the beginning of the year. Our goals, honestly, at the beginning of the season were to win three races, uh, to sit on another pole, to get in the Bush Clash and to finish in the top five in points to, and to grow as a team, you know, be more consistent every week. Well, we got more consistent every week and that was the main goal we were wanting to reach and, and the rest of the stuff kind of fell in place. So we had to set new goals halfway through the season and, uh, you know, we, we want to win a couple more races this year. We really do. We want to win a real short track race. I mean, not, not that Bristol wasn't a real short track, but uh, we'd really like to win a Martinsville or a Wilkesboro and, and um, we improved our road race program, so we've met a lot of our goals. We've just got to uh, keep trying to improve every week now. Anybody care to bet they won't? Forget all the talk about the Monte Carlo being a better car as the reason the Rainbow Warriors are better than anyone else. This team has won more races, led more laps by a long shot than any other Chevy team. In the 24 cars case, the success is partly team chemistry, which Everham is quick to point out. But a lot of it is the man behind the wheel. Jeff has matured a lot as a driver. He's really become a good thinking driver, and I've always said that. You know, his his biggest asset is is the way he uses his head, and he's really using it this year. And between that and the guy, the way the guys are working together, and how much they've learned, it's I think that's the biggest step we've taken forward. 
This team had one of the biggest leads ever coming out of Dover, and they've been besieged by questions about their first title run. Their attitude through this? Keep your focus. This might be the the best opportunity we ever have. So, you know, you know it's definitely something that, that we're focusing on. We're just not talking about it. We're, we're definitely, you know, thinking about it. We're just trying not to, to jinx ourselves or trying not to get, uh, you know, overconfident. And, and we realize this is Winston Cup racing. It's very competitive. Uh, any edge you have can be, can be gone in a second. And bad news for everyone chasing the DuPont team. The Dover race taught them an important lesson. We started worrying about racing the three and four car, and we almost gave the race away. You know, halfway through that race, we decided, hey, we're going to race the 43, pit when he pits, and take tires short like everybody else, and try and win the race. And that's what we did, and we gained more points than if we would have sat back and tried to run third or fourth. So, you know, we've just got to stick to our plan, and as long as we do that, I don't, I don't think that uh, the guys will feel any pressure. You know, we've had cars capable of winning races, and, uh, you know, even though we're, we're in the lead for the points right now, uh, you know, we're not going to do anything crazy and, and stick my nose where I shouldn't be sticking it. But, uh, you know, we're going to try to take it to the front if, if that's what it wants to do. Those of us who have spent time in the garage have watched Gordon's professional and personal life grow. But maybe Evernham knows best why this phenom is likely to make it to the top rung this year. He's finally getting to be what he's wanted to be all his life. He's wanted to be a professional race driver, the caliber of a, a Dale Earnhardt or a Richard Petty, and, and he's earning his way into those ranks, and I think he's found some peace. He's a lot more peaceful and easygoing than he used to be. It's almost scary to think what will happen if this team gets any more at peace with themselves and each other. Chances are this won't be the first year that they chase a championship either and may not be the first one that they end up losing one. They probably get one real quick here and get another one. We're just uh, in first gear. Coming up next, we'll start sprinting around the country right after this. Let's shift up into second gear for our weekly flinging and slinging of dirt where Steve Kinzer has won his 400th World of Outlaws race in Santa Maria, California. Knowing Steve, he considers that no big deal. We'll have the highlights next week since the airlines managed to lose the tape again. In the points, Dave Blaney continues to lead with Jack Houghton Shield uh, still within striking distance. Now, this weekend uh, was also the USAC Four Crowns race at Eldora Speedway where track promoter Earl Baltus was celebrating 30 years at the helm. The Midgets have giant problems with Jeff Hunt going for the most destructive ride of the evening on lap 10 of the feature. There was some wonderful three-way racing between leader Tracy Hines, Tony Stewart, and Kenny Irwin. By lap 20, Hines has faded, and the nine and four cars stage a driving clinic for the rest of the event without ever touching. At the checkers, USAC Midgets points leader Tony Stewart has the victory, and after the race, he shows Irwin what he thinks of his capable driving. There's a look at the top five with Stewart extending his points lead. More on that later. Stewart makes it a double with a dominating performance in the sprint car portion of the show, and that win also helps him build on his Loctite Sprint's points lead. And son of a gun if that guy darn near didn't do it in the Silver Crown race. Fans couldn't much complain, though, about the winner. Jack Hewitt in the number 63 was nearly killed at this event two years ago. This night he takes over just past halfway and drives to the win. Stewart is second here, and both he and Hewitt continue to trail Dave Darland in the Silver Crown points. Here's a look at all three divisions' points after the Four Crown Nationals. was also thunder in the Keystone State where the Stars uh, Series raced and the club All-Stars were turning laps in Ohio. Stephanie Boyd has those stories. The club All-Stars spend Saturday night at Portsmouth Raceway where outside pole sitter Kelly Kenzer takes the lead at the green in the number four. And for the first 10 laps, Tim Schaefer in the 50 holds down the runner-up spot. But Joey Saldana in the 77 is on the move and he gets past Schaefer for second on lap 11. 
For the first half of the 40 lapper, Kenzer is in total control, but just past halfway, Saldana is able to challenge and he gets by in traffic for the lead. In the final laps, Kenzer tries his best to regain the point, but Saldana is able to hold him off for a record 16th feature win this season. Schaefer holds on to third, followed by Frankie Kerr and points leader Dale Blaney. From Club All-Stars, we move to the Stars Late Models and last Sunday's 7th annual Pittsburgher 100. The first lap is a great one and only an indication of things to come as pole sitter Lynn Geisler in the number one takes the lead with number 28 Dick Barton and number 18 Scott Bloomquist swapping the runner-up spot. But behind them and on the move is Jack Boggs in the B4. By lap two, he's already gotten by Bloomquist and Barton and as they reach turn four, he gets past Geisler for the point. So the battle to watch is for second, first between Geisler and Barton, with Barton in the 28 getting the advantage. Then later it's between Barton and Bloomquist, and this time the 18 gets the upper hand. After that, Bloomquist makes a run on Boggs in a terrific side-by-side -side duel, but when lap traffic holds both drivers up, something has to give, and Bloomquist makes sure it's the traffic and not him. By this time, Boggs has led 88 of 100 laps, but on lap 91, Bloomquist is finally able to get by. Then with two to go, Boggs blows a motor, while Bloomquist continues on to collect his third Pittsburgher 100 title and a $21,000 paycheck. Bart Hartman gets ahead of Barton for second. Davy Johnson and Darrell Lanigan are fourth and fifth. For On Pit Road Final Edition, I'm Stephanie Boyd. Bloomquist, he loves a camera, doesn't he? All right, coming up next, we'll do a quick paving job and cover the action for the Hooters series after this. the clutch, grab the shifter and move it one over, one up notch to third, and uh, final edition continues now with the Hooters Late Model and Formula Cup Series. First visit to a brand new track down in Lakeland, Florida. Rain uh, had delayed the opening of the track a couple of months, and the Late Models christened it Saturday night. A clean start? It's always possible, but with this field of Hooters Late Model stars chomping at the bit, this is what you get. You won't have time to count all the cars, so I'll tell you there's 18 banged up machines sitting in turn one. Mario Goslin's Budweiser number 10 is collected, as well as Bobby Gill in the Goodwrench number 71. They're both in the top 10 points battle. The red flag is needed to clean up all the carnage, but no one is hurt. Back underway and Dick Anderson is all alone up front in the number 92 Dodge. Right in the middle of all kinds of traffic, though, is Goslin. He's trying to make his way back toward the front. Another caution slows his efforts momentarily. That's Russell Bearden stopped in turn two. Then Tony Altieri finds a parking place on the front stretch in the 21. Larry Thompson follows suit in the 61. He's literally sitting on the end of the pit road wall. And yet another caution. This time it's John Crow in the Jackaroo barbecue sauce number 38 who needs the most attention. For most of the way, Anderson has been on cruise control, but it's time to disengage as points leader Mike Garvey in the 91 is moving in, and with a lap car blocking the 92, Garvey squeezes by for the top spot. Then Jimmy Cope slows the action with an expired engine, and Nevin Jenkins in the three does the same on the front straight. But up front, it's the points man Mike Garvey holding on staying out of trouble for his fourth win of the season in the Magby Contractors number 91. Second is Anderson, followed by Goslin, who makes the comeback of the night for third. Then it's Russell Bearden and Randy Fox completing the top five. Meanwhile, the Formula Cup points battle is every bit as close, and with a $100,000 championship bonus sitting out there, it was all business for 100 laps. It finally happened, the first race at a speedway the Hooters folks owned. The Formula Cup cars had the usual opening act, and as usual, Anthony Lazaro was top qualifier, but deep in the top ten on the pill draw. Outside front row starter Sam Schmidt quickly takes the point in the 100-lap show. The title chase quickly takes on major drama, as points leader Alan May is smoking almost as soon as the green falls. A providential caution allows May to pit and get fixed. He's at the rear of the field and working his way forward after that. What was the trouble? Well, the inspection plug in his oil tank had fallen out, and car owner Lou D'Agostino put a penny in place to do the job. 
that one cent part could end up winning the championship for May down the road. Meanwhile, back up front, or near the front, David Elliott in the tens on the charge from the tenth starting spot. He can't win from there, can he? John Calcutt has some problems on the 5.8 mile speedway, but other than that, most everyone figures out how to stay out of trouble. Just past halfway, reigning series champ Anthony Lazaro takes the lead, and he's done yeoman work coming from eight. Elliott comes along, and so much for conventional wisdom saying that these races can't be won from worse than six. Elliott will not only get in front, he'll have a little breathing room at the checkers to get his second win in the series. Lazaro will take second with Schmidt next, and May rallies into the top five. Now, coming up next, we'll be joined by a driver who's been mashing the gas pretty hard this year in the Grand National Series, and later on, a heavyweight dispute may be looming over the Indy 500 next year. Stay with us. I'm back to Daytona, and I just sat down with Jason Keller, and I said, Jason, let's draw a picture of exactly how this year is going to go. I think you might have had championship written at the end of it because you're probably that optimistic about the way the year would go. But nevertheless, you've made a pretty good effort this year. Well, I tell you, you know, everything's really come together well. Uh, last year, we're 18th in the points, and this year we're sitting fifth with a really good chance of finishing third. So uh, things have went real well for us this year. I'm really excited. We finally got that first win under our belt, so we're looking forward to many more. For those of us who know a little bit about racing, to jump from 18th to fifth in the points, is no little step or it even two skips and a hop. That's that's a that's a, a, a leap, if you will. How did how did you do that? Well, I tell you, you know, there was a lot of things that came into play. Uh, the sponsorship of Budget Gourmet really helped a lot, and uh, uh, you're only as good as the people you have surrounding you. And I have wonderful people surrounding me and a, and a, a wonderful race team. And uh, I tell you, there's not there wasn't just one thing. There was a, a lot of things that came into play, and uh, thank goodness that I was a part of it. And uh, thank goodness I'm a part of the race team. I'm a part of because. Uh, they do one heck of a job for me, and I'm just long for the ride. Yeah, well, it's, and it's been a pretty good ride so far this year, and I have to believe that part of that is the fact that normally when guys have problems, you can trace it back to there's engine problems, there can be uh, personnel problems, and, of course, there can be always the bad luck syndrome. But for you, <laughs> engines have not been that big a problem. You guys lost one at the first of the year, and, and how much has that contributed? Well, I tell you, you know, H&E from Richmond, Virginia, they do a wonderful job on my motors, and uh, uh, rock solid every week, knock on wood. and. Uh, uh, we're in the, uh, the new Chevrolet Monte Carlo, so that's uh, been a big bonus for us this year in our race team. And uh, the engines, uh, engines definitely haven't been a problem for us, and uh, hopefully they'll uh, continue to be as strong as they have. In the race car, you are you more comfortable now? I would believe that after yeah. you go four or five yeah. races, boy, and it is rock solid, <laughs> you, every time you get in, you get in, and you're not trying to listen for those little things to signal something's going to go wrong. Well, I tell you, you know, last year we had some problems there at the end of the year with the V6s, and uh, it did make you a little gun shy to get in the car, but uh, now I'm, I'm more confident in, in my equipment. I'm more confident in myself. I, I feel that uh, that I can do it because uh, the crew gives me such a good race car every week. Uh, it it uh, now they just lean on me and tell me to drive hard. So uh, it's uh, it's nice to be a part of the deal, and uh, it's just uh, uh, it's getting better and better. And uh, we're definitely not to the level we need to be uh, yet. So I'm uh, looking forward to. Uh, to perform in a little bit better. I watch a lot of races on TV. I normally get up and work around and do a little of this, that, and the other and kind of half watch them. But that one in Indianapolis, I must admit, <laughs> I, I did sit down and I, I watched all that uh, real consistent car and a real consistent effort that night. You made it look easy, but was it? I tell you, now that was really tough for us, but uh, it was just our night to win. You know, we've always said we, we've, ha we've had good races in the past. Uh, you look back at Dover last year and, and things uh, coming down to the end, we haven't won races, but uh, when, it was, when it's your time to win the race, you're going to win the race, and it was our night, and uh, you go back to a little story there at Indy, and uh, my crew put that car together in three days. You know, we had wrecked the car that we were going to run there previously the week before mm -hmm. at South Boston, so uh, they put the car together in three days, and, and boom, there we were in Indy and won the race, and uh, uh, you know, it was a, it was a little, little story there, and it, it was really nice. Want to wish you the best. Thank uh, you so Charlotte's much. I guess Charlotte's the next race it. for you guys, yeah, and uh, forward to good it. luck to you. Thank you so much. Bro. All right, Jason Keller. Coming up next, the word boycott is being banded about for the uh, world's biggest race. We'll try to sort it all out right after this. Ray Hall has a steady employment deal for the next five years. Ray Hall and Carl Hogan have parted company as owners of the team, and Bobby's got all of it to himself again. 
You also got uh, Miller beer through the year 2000 and a deal announced Thursday. It may take that many years to sort out what the uh, growing ugliness, if you will, between the IndyCar and Upstart Indy Racing League is going through. Associated Press is reporting that some IndyCar owners are talking about boycotting next year's Indy 500 uh, unless all 33 positions are open to qualifying. You'll recall that the IRL has uh, already announced that 25 spots will be guaranteed to the top 25 teams in their points. That leaves eight slots open to IndyCar drivers. The Indianapolis Star, uh, more importantly Robin Miller, reports that there might not be a competing, or there might be a competing IndyCar race sanctioned at Michigan on the same day as the 500. All this posturing is uh, happening eight months ahead of time. Now, one other note, IndyCar is 0 for 3 in its appeals. Uh, that's because a three-member panel reinstated Alan Sir Jr.'s Portland win. You recall he had been DQ'd because of a post-race inspection which found his car too low. After three days of testimony, the appeals panel ruled that the uh, a discrepancy uh, measuring in the way that it was measured tilted the judgment of Penske ra in Penske's racing's favor. The result does not affect anyone's position in the final standings. IndyCar has also lost uh, the other two times that uh, teams have appealed the official rulings. Now, last week, having said all of that, we had hoped to show you highlights from the annual fall festival at Jennerstown Speedway, where the ISMA supermods were featured uh, as the big attraction. Mother Nature thought the action should wait a day to get started, and that means you had to wait a whole week to see what happened. A day late means nothing short for the fans at Jennerstown Speedway as they watch West Coast visitor Rebel Jackson Jr. battle pole sitter Russ Wood at the start of the feature, with Jackson leading the first 17 laps, then Wood taking over from there. Meanwhile, series points leader Mike Ordway is an early casualty as he heads to the pits on lap 37 when his power steering goes. The biggest incident of the night is this multi-car pileup on the front stretch, which happens on lap 68. That brings out the red flag because there's lots of damage to clean up. With 15 to go, Wood is still leading when suddenly he slows when the 29 starts smoking. That turns the lead over to number 11, Chris Purley, who goes on from there to collect the checkers. Yeah, we started out real strong Friday and uh, the rains came Saturday and we were really hoping that we'd get the race in then and we didn't, so we had to wait it out today. Luckily, the track didn't change too much for us. We didn't have to change our setup. Everything worked. Behind Pearly are Steve Joya and Joe Gosick. Dave Schulich and Scott Martell round out the top five. And in other action at Jennerstown, number 26 Bob Arsenberger celebrates his birthday by taking a win in the late model feature. Nothing like a win on your birthday. Coming up next, uh, we'll catch you up on all the NASCAR Dash Wars as Final Edition rolls on. Welcome back to the big show, everybody. Last Sunday, the Goodies Dash Series tore up some equipment in their first visit to North Wilkesboro in eight years. The series returns to Wilkesboro after an eight-year absence and may not want to come back again. Even as subcompacts, there isn't enough room to get around the six-tenths mile, and this incident ends Will Hobgood's slim hopes of repeating as series champ. This is one of the more tame tangles, as much of this race is run under yellow. There are five cars in the middle of this one, including Dennis Setzer, who doesn't continue. Think these cars aren't going fast? Think again. Mickey York is in the 24, and Scott Weaver is the suppository. This is an ever-ready wreck that just keeps on going and going and going. This one's good for a red flag with no one hurt. The pace setter from the green has been David Hutto, who's close to erasing Larry Cottle's points lead. With 11 laps to go, near calamity for Hutto as Johnny Smith's in the way. The former leader will continue, dropping only to fourth. With Mike Swain Jr. now in the lead, there are three laps to go when this battle for third takes care of Robert Huffman's afternoon. This sets up a green-white checkers finish with Swain driving to victory lane for the second time this season. Pretty good, considering he started 11th. The car was pretty good to start with. We had to start by points because of the rain delay, um, and I think we could have qualified better than our points were. So uh, we just had to bide our time and come on one up through the field. And, um, you know, everybody gave me a lot of room, and uh, it was a really great race, pretty clean for us. And um, I'm just glad we come on the winner today. Caudill ran in the top five all afternoon with Amick and Goodwin rounding out the top five. This is Neil Kassebaum reporting for On Pit Road Preview. Yeah, Swaim Jr.'s taking on just like his old man did. Six days later, the subcompact thrill show headed to Florida, bent uh, but not broken. 
Walpath, the car count was down to 25. But it's not how many show up, it's who's in the ones who do. David Hutto's on the pole again, and Larry Coddles mired back in the field, and the points leader will never contend. This is one of those days for Wilkesboro winner Mike Swaim Jr. Here's one of the yellows involving him. Here's a bigger one later, but he'll still take it to the checkers. Now, the official race report says that number 10 Danny Bagwell doesn't lead this one, but there's the start-finish line, and he's in front. Go figure. Not much later, and Hutto's back in front, but he can't be since he never trailed officially. Somebody needs to explain this one to me. It doesn't matter since Bagwell has a motor go bad before mid-race. Maybe all the strain from battling the phantom leader takes its toll on Hutto's tires because Dave Stacy in the six takes the lead and in fact goes on to his first ever dash victory. Most fans may remember him better for heading into Lake Lloyd at Daytona a few years back in a dash race. Give him credit, Stacy gets the win and does a perfect bootleg turn on his way back to the victory stand. Hutto ends up third behind Huffman with Amick and Hopgood in the top five. Cottle finishes 12th, so Hutto has taken the points lead for the first time in his young career. There are two races left. That one will get interesting here for the last couple of races. Right after this, a driver with a mission uh, who has a chance to gloat a little bit uh, after a big win. Stay with us. So when we talk about some of the major touring series and racing, we tend to forget that not everybody is a full-time driver. Take, for instance, Johnny Rumley. He's been in the Bush Grand National Big Johnson Chevy since the spring, and he's a roofer by trade. After last Saturday's win at Dover, he may be able to think about going full-time. Last Wednesday, he stopped by and visited with our Mark Allen. Johnny, you said your first win a couple of years ago at Hickory. The phone didn't ring too much, but what about after Dover? Well, uh, it got pretty heavy. I think uh, 15 or 20 people called before I got home, and uh, of course Sunday evening and Monday and uh, uh, last night and so on. So it, it's been a real busy time for us. What sense of vindication and personal satisfaction do you get from winning on a super speedway? <laughs> a whole lot. It's, it's hard to describe. You don't want to sound uh, uh, too bad when you say things about it being a speedway, but at the, at the same time, a lot of people put me down for that, said I couldn't do it. Uh, for whatever reasons, and I think we've proven different there. You know, we had to race real hard to, to just stay in a lead lap at one time and, and uh, had to race a good race car driver, and that's Ricky Craven. So I, I think we earned it as a team. That's, that's a big part. How satisfying was it to you down the stretch? Because the television announcers, and let's face it, the folks in the stands and most of the people in the pits when you were up front for that last restart said, yeah, Rumley, older tires, He'll be 7th, 8th, ninth, and 3-4 laps. How satisfying does it make to prove all the experts wrong? Uh, it was unreal. I mean, the guys on the crew, you know, we'd come down 10 or 9, nine or 10 laps to go. They said, uh, it's yours, go for it. And uh, uh, we did. And uh, I tell you, in about three laps, when we started pulling away from that 90 car, uh, it's hard to describe how it felt. It's the best feeling on earth, and especially when uh, they give us one to go. I uh, wanted to do something special, but uh, I, I did. I said it to myself and, and the man upstairs, so uh, it, it all come, come at a good time for us. Now, for a lot of people who don't know, Johnny Rumley is a full-time roofer. What does this do toward possibly moving you toward your ultimate goal, which has all along been to drive a race car full-time? Well, I think it's one step closer. Uh, I don't think people can deny me now how serious I really am about wanting to race, uh, do it full-time. Uh, kind of like some of these other uh, full-time race car drivers. I don't want a real job. I want to race for a living. So uh, you don't have a little fun. And, uh, of course, it's serious business, but at the same time, you've got to enjoy what you're doing, and, and that's what I enjoy. You know, you proved a lot of the experts wrong, too, in the respect that the team changed drivers in the middle of a season. And that's always hard for another driver then to step into that ride and to have any success whatsoever. What made this combination work so well for you? Well, uh, I, I think it goes back to 1992. Don Beverly gave me a shot uh, in my first bush ride. Uh, we, we, you know, we, we accomplished a little bit of a goal there. We sat on a pole first time in a car. We led 135 laps against, against some very good competition. Uh, I think through the years, he's had, you know, he's had a couple other drivers in there. They did good. Hermie did good in that car. And uh, then it came down to this year. and. And, and they had some problems, and I'm not going to say it was a driver or what it was, but anyway, they, they decided to make a change, and 
uh, you know, I wasn't going to turn down the offer. And uh, me and Kirk's good friends, and I hope we still are, and I, I think we will be. But uh, uh, we won't go looking at uh, whose who's fault it was. It, it just worked out for the best for me. So now Johnny Rumley's name is not just Johnny Who. People have a little better sense of who you are and where you want to go in your racing career. What about 1996 now? Do you stay put? Uh, give us some sense of what that crystal ball looks like. Yeah, I've, I've pretty much made the decision. I'm going to stay with Don Beverly, and uh, he, he's gearing up. We're buying new cars, uh, Ronnie Hopkins chassis. Uh, we feel that's the way to go. We've got a good engine program with Hones and Eames, and, uh, of course, uh, Chevrolet's behind us. So I, I think we're getting things in line for 1996 to be consistent. The guys up the shop are working real hard, and we need to back this win up with a, with a good finish at Charlotte and Rockingham and Miami. So it'll kind of set the stage for, through the winter. Got a feeling somebody's going to talk JR into a, a full-time deal next year. Now, last Sunday, the Winston West Series ran uh, other events, but this uh, ran another event, but this just wasn't any race. It was a celebrated longevity of a man named Herschel McGriff. Jerry Garrett has more. The first Southern 500. The year was 1950. Few drivers in that historic event are even alive today, but one of the top finishers is still racing. He's considered the ageless wonder. He's Herschel McGriff and he's 67 years old. He's the only driver to race in all five decades that NASCAR has been around. And last weekend, McGriff celebrated 50 years in racing at the track where it all began, Portland Speedway. McGriff's most famous victory came in the 1950 Mexican road race, a grueling 2100 mile affair that he won by just 76 seconds over the likes of Bill France Sr. and Curtis Turner. Over the years, McGriff's familiar number 04 consistently found its way to victory circle. McGriff liked to race close to home, and he was known as the Richard Petty of West Coast stock car racing. His schedule has slowed down a little bit in recent years, but not his driving style. Showing little signs of rust, McGriff led his golden anniversary race, and only a slight pit stop miscue late in the event relegated him to a very close third place behind the photo finish victory of Doug George over Ernie Cope. Reporting for On Pit Road, this is Jerry Garrett. Thanks, Jerry. Herschel's absolutely one of the best guys you'll ever know. Up next on the Hit Parade, Ernie Irvin sets up to uh, make a comeback. You don't want to miss that, so don't go away. Many drivers have come back from critical injuries to race again, but few have done it under the intense glare of the media like Ernie Irvin has. His recovery was uh, very public, and through it all, he displayed a real grace and dignity which inspired many, but Mother Nature conspi conspired to delay his return one week. Rain wiped out qualifying for the super truck race, and uh, since uh, he was, uh, had no owner's points, uh, he didn't race. The event was rescheduled for Monday morning in Martinsville. Now, last Tuesday at a news conference announcing his return, our Stephanie Boyd talked with Ernie. It was just one year ago that a struggling Ernie Irvin made his first appearance in front of reporters since suffering a near-fatal crash during practice at Michigan International Speedway. It was a much different Ernie Irvin who again appeared before reporters last Tuesday, this time to confirm what everyone already knew, that he is returning to Winston Cup racing. Now Irvin is much like his old self, kidding, confident, and focused on racing. You know, when I started driving for Robert Yates, he, he really taught me a lot of stuff about being patient, and uh, um, I, I actually got a whole new outlook towards racing when I started driving for Robert and Larry and uh, all the people at Texaco, and when that happened, then I became a better race car driver, and um, I think I can just do the exact same thing I was doing before, and hopefully that'll um, bring me to success. Physically, Irvin says he's in the best shape of his life. It's the left eye that's still giving him problems. He wears glasses with a prism to correct his double vision, but will need an eye patch during competition. It's worked fine during testing, but what about race conditions? The only way you can do that is to get out there and do it, and um, that's just the thing that we, that we have to do. And, you know, I think we're taking the precautions and uh, um, stuff, you know, really good as far as, um, you know, go to super truck and and uh, run Martinsville, then run Wilkesboro, and then, you know, play it by ear after that and um, just figure out where we can do. And uh, um, I think it's just a matter of um, time before we all know uh, if I can do it or not. A year later, and, and 
several months after this accident, he was able to return to a racetrack with the same car and run identical speeds. And, and there's a lot of turns there, and there's a lot of shift and a lot of things that you do. And that said, Ernie still got it. So I think back in, in the spring when we were at Road Atlanta, that convinced Robert Yates that Ernie's ready to go. Ready to go back to a sport that almost cost him his life. Irvin admits that he's a little bit nervous, but says even his wife Kim supports his decision. It, it's been really tough on her. She's the one that had to sit at the hospital and the doctor come in and say, you got a 10% chance of living. And, um, you know, she was the one that had to, to stomach that. I was, I was basically uh, unconscious in a, in a coma, so I don't remember none of that. And um, she's the one that's had it the toughest. And, um, you know, she's, she's stuck with me. And, um, you know, that, that's some of the stuff that, that, that really helps. So does the loyalty from Robert Yates Racing and from all the Winston Cup fans. And like any true competitor, Irvin is now ready to repay them from the place he knows best, behind the wheel. What a story, what a story. This coming weekend, Ernie will return to Winston Cup at North Wilkesboro in the number 88 car. And to clear up any confusion about next season, Irvin will be back in the 28 car with Dale Jarrett moving over to the 88 car. Now, last year, IMSA's first full season of World Sports Car Competition drew to a close at Phoenix. This year, PIR is the next to the last stop, and it's uh, only the third time all year that the open cockpit class has run under the lights. You get a merit badge if you uh, know the other two times were Daytona and Sebring. So, what uh, might we expect at Phoenix? So, uh, let's take a look. Last season finished on an awkward note at Phoenix. Wayne Taylor won the WSC title when fellow competitor Jim Downing chose not to drive enough laps to challenge him in the points. This year, Phoenix won't quite have that drama, but it could decide the championship. James Weaver is second to Furman Velez, but thinks he has an advantage. I honestly feel I'm driving with the best team, and I've got the best car, and I think Gandia must believe I've got the best car as well. So I would think psychologically we've definitely got the upper hand, particularly as we've beaten Scandia in five out of the last six races. Um, you know, you can't bank psychology, but it's certainly a good start. There's another school of thought on that which comes from the Scandia team, where Mauro Baldi is Velez's teammate. The Scandia team is trying, of course, to help uh, Fermin to, to maintain the lead against the fours that are quite quick and coming up with James Weaver. So what I can do is, for me, the, 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 the chances to win the championship are still there if you look at the numbers, but uh, they are quite low in, 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 uh, in percentage. So what I have to, let's say, hope is that the number one driver, number two driver is in the point. They get retired at least once, and then me to be in the first two or three places, and that would bring us all the three at the same level, you know. Last year in GTS 1, Nissan brought four cars to help ensure Steve Millen would win the championship. This year, he's still sidelined from a broken neck, and Oldsmobile has already clinched the manufacturer's title. For Nissan driver Johnny O'Connell and Weaver, a slight change in the running format with WSC and GTS cars together will help in several ways. Endurance has always been our strength. I think you'd be hard-pressed to find a team that's done better over all the endurance races than, than we have. So the longer you make the race, the more these guys are, are smiling. Also, this is the first year it's going to be at night for us. So, you know, in the past, the previous two years, when we'd go out there, I mean, going into turn one on the oval, it was, it was miserable because you couldn't see it all. Uh, sun was right in your eyes. So now visibility will be a whole lot better. Engines will run cooler. You'll probably be able to get away with running a softer tire because the racetrack will be cooler. So I think it's going to benefit everything. It's, yeah, the, the track's fine. I think having the race in the evening is an excellent idea because it's a bit cooler. Uh, we had a great crowd there last year, and you can see the whole track. On the mile-and-a-half layout, it will get awfully crowded come Saturday night, no matter what the temperature. And we're in overdrive, and we still got one more segment to go, so stay with us. Hard to believe that one of the reasons that we've learned how to go so much faster in the world of auto racing is because we've learned how to stop a little bit faster. And what I hold in my hand here, they tell me, at least Dwight Kahn tells me here from Hawk Brake, is, uh, is really part of the reason that we're able to stop. Nice to have you here. And uh, I guess that, that is true, though. I mean, 
brakes have gotten better, therefore we're able of going faster because we can get slowed down when we've got to get slowed down. Is that right? Sure. I mean, that's, that's absolutely right. Uh, one thing that we've learned, actually all of our technology, Pat, comes from aircraft. We've been in the aircraft brake business for 30 years, and recently our scientists have figured out that you could take that technology used to stop a great big aircraft, transfer it into auto racing. And that, uh, that's what's created Hawk Brake for us. And we've taken that technology, transferred it from aircraft into racing, uh, and uh, as a result, we've come up with a whole bunch of new materials to help the racers stop a little bit faster. Well, in case you don't know, folks, this is money. <laughs> uh, let me tell you that uh, brakes are, are, not, uh, are not the most expensive part on the car, but I'll guarantee you that every race car driver out there wants the very best brakes that he can. And I know that I've been running Hawk brakes all year. And uh, these, uh, you guys have put some time into this. And this is a combination of carbon and metallic. Is that yeah, right? Yeah. And uh, to show you, uh, this is totally metallic brake here. Uh, we have a carbon fire, a carbon brake, I should say, mm -hmm. which is awfully light. Now, Super light, this yeah. would be used where? In, well, this in, is used in the in world of auto racing. Does it have a use yet? Sure, sure. In, in two two areas really. Formula One in Europe, and also uh, some of the drag teams use it, the top fuelers and teams like that. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's because it's so light, and it really can. Uh, handle well under an extreme amount of, of heat and energy going into the brake okay, system. This is not a big electrical part, so therefore yeah. I can't retrieve a lot of electrical data from this piece once you put it in a race car and use it. Yeah. So how do you guys go about figuring out how to make a better brake? Is it yeah. just solely on wear? Well, no, not really. What we do is we have a special program we've set up at Hawk Brake called RDR. It stands for Research, Development, and Response. And what we do is we take our scientists and we go out to the racetrack. We go to a lot of different racetracks with a lot of different types of racing. And we talk to the racers. And we listen to what their needs are. And we take the information and the data from, from their track and their car. We take it back to our factory. We put it in a, into our dynamometer. Mm -hmm. And we test it. And we test it and we test it. Then we take that material, we send it back out, and we ask them how it's doing. We keep doing that until we get a material that fits just perfectly for that type of racing. By the way, we, we have the 800 number up if, for people that want more information yeah. about this. And we, we only have a little bit of time left. But to answer me this. This is basically compounds. Yeah. So if, I, if I'm reading this right, changing compounds changes the, the usability, if you will, of the brake itself. Do you change compounds a lot during mm. the year based on the research that you get back from, from people? We're very cautious about that. I mean, we go to market with a new material very reluctantly. We're careful about it uh, because the racer depends on getting the same material every single time. When he orders a Hawk Blue, he wants a Hawk Blue. We have tight quality control to ensure that he gets that. Super, super. This is great. It's very interesting to me. Very, yeah. Thank you very much for uh, filling us in on the, on the brake business. I can tell you that uh, in my Christmas stocking, I'd like about uh, three or four cases of these would be really neat. Thanks for stopping by. I appreciate it. And uh, the checkered flag is out. We're still running at the finish. We'd like to uh, think we won this race, get all the highlights in before the hour's up. And it looks like we made it. So as we head to victory lane, we'll say so long. Have a great week, everybody. I'm Pat Patterson for all of us here. Have a great week. We'll see you next time. Communications provided by Racing Electronics. For a free catalog, call 1-800-272-7111.